Our guest speaker is Professor Henri Pontel, to whom I begin by thanking on behalf of the faculty for accepting the invitation and share his knowledge with us. It's a great honor. Professor Henri Pontel is Professor Emeritus in departments of Criminology, Law and Society and Sociology at the University of California and a distinguished university professor in the Department of Sociology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Till recently, he was the vice president of the American Society of Criminology. He is a well-known scholar on topics related to the study of what color crime, namely corporate crime, financial and healthcare fraud, cybercrime, his research interests also include the study of punishment, criminal justice system, comparative criminology, and other criminological issues. He has many publications on these topics, and some of his books are a reference on the study of white color crime. I highlight three the International Handbook of White Color and Corporate Crime, Profit with Honor, White Color Crime, and Looting of America. Big Money, Crime, Fraud and Politics in the Savings and Loan Crisis. Well, I will not extend the description of the vast curriculum of Professor Henry Potter, but reiterating our thanks for his presence at this conference, it's time to give the floor to our honorable speaker. The participants may put questions in the chat for the final debate. And so, Professor Henry Portel, you may initiate your presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Cruz, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Faria. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you on Zoom. I would have obviously preferred to be there with you in person, but perhaps we could do that uh, at a later time. Um, so without further ado, let me just again express my uh, great appreciation for inviting me. It's an honor to be here with you, and uh, hopefully this presentation will be interesting and useful for the participants. <clears throat> so let me begin. Um, I, I trust everyone can see the slide that's up here right now and not me. <laughs> Good. All right, so the presentation, uh, this will take maybe 20, 30 minutes, and then we'll have time for discussion. Um, the title of the presentation comes from uh, the title of James Q. Wilson's provocative book, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, Thinking About Crime, which I read many, many years ago uh, while I was actually doing my doctoral dissertation. Um, we'll then go on to talk about the costs and consequences of white collar and corporate crime, uh, societal reactions, uh, Edwin Lemmert's work, uh, the notion of postponed violence, which uh, relates to Ralph Nader's term, um, definition, definitional issues, which we won't have time to go into fully, but we'll talk a little bit about them. Edward Sutherland's initial definition, uh, Gilbert Geis's uh, work in that regard as well. Uh, then I'll talk about major forms of white collar corporate crime, both in the US and around the world. Uh, the, trivia, the, the aspects of what I call trivialization of white collar and corporate crime uh, in the popular uh, uh, nomenclature. Uh, and then I'll talk about in relation to that notion of trivialization, how we don't treat it with the, uh, 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 the amount of uh, attention that it deserves. Uh, I'll talk about major financial crises, the savings and loan debacle, uh, in the U.S., Enron, Gall, uh, the 2008 mortgage crisis, which created a worldwide uh, depression uh, or an economic crisis, depression in many countries. Um, then I'll talk about issues of capacity and control and finally uh, changing some narratives that we currently have about white collar crime. Uh, and so this is a general talk. Uh, it's about my thoughts on this uh, relating to the research I've done uh, uh, over the, in the past. So without further ado, let's begin. Uh, the title, uh, why this title? Well, in his polemic book, Thinking About White Collar, uh, th sorry, Thinking About Crime, published in 1975, uh, James Q. Wilson uh, marginalized the term white collar crime uh, and at the beginning of the book. 
and he lumped it together with victimless crimes, such as gambling and prostitution. Now, when I read this book, I was actually working in the area of criminal deterrence. Wilson, as some of you may know, was a very uh, well-known conservative author on, uh, topic, on the topic of crime. He was not a criminologist. He was a policy analyst. And he was uh, a very dear to some presidents, such as Richard Nixon, and, uh, uh, who uh, embraced his ideas about deterrence and increasing uh, uh, law enforcement to try to solve the problem of crime. I wasn't interested at all in the topic of white collar crime when I read this, but when I started working in the area and came back to this later on, I remembered that Wilson really didn't treat this topic uh, with the respect uh, that it deserved in terms of its consequences and costs. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Wilson, by the way, taught it at Harvard, uh, UCLA, and finally at Pepperdine uh, uh, in his uh, later uh, career. And those are all universities in the United States. <clears throat> Wilson states that, and this is from his own words, most citizens, including himself, do not consider white collar offenses to be very serious compared to street crime. And my take on this, and I've written about this elsewhere with some colleagues, is that Wilson's intuition about the predominance of such a belief is quite correct. That is, you know, what he said was basically true. But the belief itself, however, is utterly wrong. And that's what I'll try to uh, point out in a few moments. White collar criminals cause more pain and death than all common criminals combined. And this, in short, is taken from the data that's been able, that we've been able to gather from regulatory reports and elsewhere, essentially I'm talking now in the US, which might be, you, know, you might be able to extrapolate to other countries as well, uh, that just in the area of medical crime, for example, the estimates are anywhere between 10 and 40%, the most conservative estimates being 10%, most uh, liberal estimates being upwards of 40, 50%. Uh, of yearly costs that are due to fraud and abuse. Uh, that amount alone uh, supersedes the amount of loss due to crime in the United States. That's just a medical fraud alone. And that's only one form of white collar crime that we'll be talking about. So white collar crimes do not leave a chalk outline on the sidewalk or blood spatter on the wall, as you could imagine. Thus, the public, in its understandable preoccupation with street crime, often has overlooked the violent aspects of elite deviance. There are violent aspects, I'll go back to medical crime as the prime example again. When medical fraud exists uh, for monetary purposes, it often takes the form of things like unnecessary surgeries and treatments. And those are violent acts against people when they are not necessary. So if you want to just look at that alone, of course, you can look at environmental crimes as well and others. But medical fraud is a direct example of uh, uh, violence done against the human body, in many cases, uh, for fraudulent purposes. One likely explanation for this inadequate attention can be derived from the cognitive rule of thumb known as the availability heuristic. This is a term in psychology. It stipulates that there is a common human tendency to judge the likelihood of occurrences in terms of how readily instances come to mind. So vivid events stick in our memories and their greater ease of recall misleads us to overrate their frequency relative to less dramatic but actually more pervasive events. And this is um, something that may be uh, uh, going on uh, with the area of white collar crime. They were exposed to violence and street crime much more, and thus it kind of misleads us into thinking that these are actually more pervasive and more serious. I'd like to turn now to the work of a, a, a former colleague, uh, sociologist Edwin Lemmer, who uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of if you study criminology. He was a social interactionist, a sociologist who basically 
uh, uh, his work formed uh, the basis of labeling theory uh, and his, his uh, seminal work on primary versus secondary deviance. He didn't call it labeling theory when he started out in his path in that area, but uh, eventually people like Howard Becker, uh, Kitsuse and others followed in his footsteps. He was a, a true uh, pathbreaker and rather uh, uh, incredible, probably one of the most important criminologists of the 20th century. These are some of his books uh, that you can see, Social Pathology, The Trouble with Evil, which was his last book, and then a compilation of uh, his work put together by his uh, nephew, Charles Lamert, uh, who teaches in the United States. Uh, he had a term that he used, one of the, in, in all of his work, he was just, there, there were many, many terms that he used. The one stuck vividly in my mind, and it was the unstable equilibrium and the societal reaction to deviance. And again, as a early labeling theorist, if you will, a social interactionist, he was concerned not so much with the primary causes of deviance and crime, but the social reactions to crime, the interactionist approach. How people react to various events uh, gives them the quality of being deviant or criminal or, uh, or conventional. So he noted that social response is essentially, quote, a compound of acceptance and rejection, frequently manifesting itself as the tacit tolerance of variant social patterns, coupled with a nominal or formal disapproval and rejection. Now, that's very high level sociologies, if you will. <laughs> it's difficult to understand, but basically what he's saying is that people sometimes accept and reject at the same time. And so the societal reaction is sometimes not very strong because they're actually accepting uh, to a degree and rejecting at the same time. Um, and this is what he refers to as the unstable equilibrium in the societal reaction to deviance. I think this is very pertinent to the study of white collar crime, I'll tell you why. The physical harm that's wrought by some forms of white collar crime can be slow and cumulative, like the mythic death by a thousand cuts. In other words, the human suffering caused by corporate cupidity frequently takes years to materialize in contrast to the graphic suddenness that usually characterizes street content of street violence. Consequently, it is easy for people to misperceive the extent of the injuries caused. Uh, and so, which in turn led James Q. Wilson to ignore white collar crime in his book on quote unquote crime. Uh, so you have this, again, this, this notion that people ignore it uh, and going back to uh, Leverett's uh, work on unequal uh, equilibrium, um, there are many forms of corruption, for example, that people will tolerate. The business narrative, for example, on corruption is sometimes positive or mixed. Uh, corruption isn't so bad because it allows business to move forward. It greases the wheels in certain countries or situations where it's necessary for economic growth, etc. So there's this narrative that people accept while at the same time thinking, well, of course, corruption is bad but sometimes we have to put up with it. So that's just one example. In terms of this notion of delayed harms and things that we don't see, and which feeds into this idea that uh, the white collar crime isn't taken very seriously, uh, here are some examples, environmental crime. These are all harms that are delayed. They take time to manifest themselves, to cause injury, to cause death, to cause in the environmental waste that we see, the, envi the environmental uh, uh, problems that arise years later through the poisoning of the earth. Uh, environmental crime is an example. Hazardous workplaces, medical malfeasance, and unsafe products, for example, are lethal manifestations of what Ralph Nader has called postponed violence. And I think that's a really important term. For those of you who don't know who Ralph Nader is, Ralph Nader was a lawyer uh, who uh, was an, uh, the first major consumer advocate in the United States. He was responsible for the 
uh, installation of seat belts, the requirement of seat belts in cars, uh, for labeling of products, etc. He also ran unsuccessfully twice for president of the United States. And there was a, a, a terrific, if you want to learn more about Ralph Nader, he's a pretty remarkable person. Uh, there's a, a, a documentary uh, that you might be able to uh, see on the internet called uh, An Unreasonable Man. And it talks about his life in terms of what he's done uh, in terms of product safety. So let's move on to definitional issues. Edwin Sutherland, um, who uh, was president of the American so Sociological Society back in the 30s, uh, talked about white collar crime and actually introduced it, introduced the term in his presidential address to that organization. And um, like some other, I guess, some other famous scholars I could think of, Robert Burton and others, he didn't really spend too much time trying to define the term white collar crime. In other words, you know, what, it, what it actually was. That wasn't so important to him. What was important to him was uh, the fact that there were lots of uh, illegal acts and unethical acts being committed by powerful people and uh, corporations. And that's what he was more concerned about. Why weren't they considered as crimes? But he defined white collar crime as crime committed by a person of respectability and high social status in the course of their occupation. Uh, this has led to a, a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, work in the, in the field in terms of well, what, what exactly is white collar crime. Uh, and of course, Sutherland didn't help very much because in his book, which was published 10 years after the speech, uh, the book White Collar Crime, he didn't study individuals. Here he's talking about persons. He studied corporations. So exactly what is it? <laughs> uh, I'll talk a little bit about this. One person who spent a lot of time with this and the person who was a close colleague and mentor to me was Gilbert Geis. Um, he was one of the foremost scholars of white collar crime in history. And these are just some of his books. He's, he wrote uh, 25 books and over four or 500 uh, research pieces, not all on white collar crime, but he was best known for his work on white collar crime. And in 1991, if you see here on the bottom of the screen, he wrote a piece which doesn't get that much attention, but I think it's really an incredibly important piece. Uh, this is, this is uh, 30 years ago. White collar crime, what is it? He wrote this piece almost uh, 40 years. Uh, is that about right? Yeah, over 40 years after Sutherland introduced the term white collar crime. In that 40 years, there was still mass confusion about oh, what is this term? What is white collar crime? Is it people? Is it organizations? Uh, is it just adjudicated cases? Is it people who settle civilly? There's a lot of these cases that settled civilly. What is it? Well, uh, and in this piece, and I won't go into all the details, we don't have time, but uh, he talks about the various definitions, the problems, individual versus organizational uh, issues, the offender-based versus, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't done offender-based, it should be offense-based. I'm sorry, it is offense-based. Offender-based versus offense-based uh, uh, definitions, et cetera. And those kinds of um, uh, issues are still rampant in the field today. The people still talk about, well, this definition, that definition. I remember years ago, uh, Gil and I were invited to a conference by the National White Collar Crime Center here in the United States. And it was uh, over a weekend and we, we got the invitation and we called each other immediately and we both had the same exact impression that we didn't want to go to this because we thought it would be useless. And of course, they did get about six or seven criminologists and locked them up in a hotel over the weekend in Virginia. And they came out and to, to, to come up with the definition of white collar crime. And of course they didn't. Uh, and um, that was the last I, I spent any time with it. John Braithwaite, uh, who many of you may know, who uh, is a professor in Australia, very famous criminologist, wrote a piece back in the 1980s saying that uh, 
the definitional issue is just not that important to argue about. That people, that what's more important is to study various forms of what could be considered uh, white collar crime, whether they be individually based uh, or organizationally based. Uh, and of course, there have been many definitional issues. Does it have to take place within the course of an occupation? Uh, so that's, that's a good uh, uh, critique. It, you, it doesn't. It can be organizational when the profits and the proceeds go back to an organization versus an individual. It could be combinations of both, et cetera. So uh, my point basically is uh, there are difficulties with the term and that's fine. Uh, and uh, we know exactly there, there are lots of offenses in the, in the criminal law that could be considered white collar crime. But white collar crime is not a legal term. It's a social construct, which includes many offenses, which could come under that label. So that's where we're at with that. What are some major forms? Well, in the US and I'm sure in Portugal and elsewhere, you know, we have the same types of, of issues. Um, I've studied this in Asia. Um, uh, I've, I've looked at it uh, closely in the US. These kinds of frauds and these kinds of crimes exist everywhere in the world uh, under different legal uh, standards. Uh, so consumer fraud, things like auto, auto repair frauds, telemarketing scams, uh, educational frauds, false advertising, price gouging, and counterfeit uh, uh, goods um, all come under consumer fraud uh, statutes in various countries. Unsafe products, adulterated foods, uh, dangerous drugs and devices, quackery and medicines, environmental crimes, water and air pollution, e-waste, environmental racism, which I'm happy to talk about if you're interested, uh, toxic waste, employee health and safety issues. Fiduciary frauds, those, those having to do with uh, uh, frauds in pension, use of pension funds, investment in financial services, insurance scams. In the US, we had a, a, a first major crisis, our, our savings and loan crisis in the 1980s and later, uh, which affected the world, the 2008 mortgage crisis. Uh, government crimes, uh, things like uh, illegal prisoner experiments, uh, in the U.S., the Iran-Contra Watergate scandals, which were, which were very big government scandals, that government scandals occur throughout the world. Uh, the corruption of public officials, federal, state, and local government frauds, kickbacks, shakedowns, and opportunistic thefts. Medical crimes, which I've mentioned, uh, having to do with equipment sales, hospitals, doctors, Medicare and Medicaid in the United States, those are our government insurance programs. So insurance program fraud, fertility fraud, research fraud, nursing home fraud, all of these have been well documented uh, in the United States. Uh, securities fraud having to do with investments, stock market, et cetera, insider trading, stock manipulations, Ponzi schemes. And Ponzi schemes are a generic term when the, these types of frauds occur all over the world, the largest in, the, in, the, in history having occurred in the United States, uh, Bernie Madoff's uh, $64 billion Ponzi scheme. I just heard just a few moments ago on the news that Bernie Madoff just died uh, while serving in prison and he wasn't going to be released and he just passed away today. Uh, corporate fraud. Uh, in the United States, we have the examples of Enron, WorldCom, Adelphia, Tyco, uh, major forms of corporate fraud, I'm sure, in Portugal and elsewhere, uh, you have similar situations. Uh, institutional corruption. Here I'm talking about the mass media and religion. Uh, in the U.S., we've had cases of phony faith healers, people who prey on uh, religious people and steal their money or gain it through fraudulent means. Uh, TV, uh, television frauds, uh, music frauds, There's, there, there are many, and these have to do with uh, 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 bribes to pay music, to play various forms of music, and television, uh, for, uh, 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 fraudulent game shows, and other kinds of things that are uh, 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 unethical and also criminal. Uh, computer crime, 
This is the new form. And, you know, whether this comes under economic crime, white collar crime, it doesn't necessarily have to be committed by a person of high status, but it certainly involves the use of uh, technology and uh, the modus operandi as, and, and the types of frauds that exist could come under white collar uh, crime. Things like embezzlement, hacking, viruses, internet scams, espionage, and of course, the ubiquitous uh, phishing, which uh, comes through our emails and tries to defraud people through uh, those means. So those are the, those are the generic types and, and with some specific types uh, listed here. And those are the, and you can see there are many, many forms, probably more than most people would ordinarily think about. <clears throat> Years ago, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan talked about this notion of defining deviancy down. And they've written about this and so have some commentators, uh, political commentators in the United States more recently. Um, Trivialization, this, this idea of trivialization that I want to talk about in a couple of minutes, uh, trivialization of white collar crime, why it's not given uh, the uh, attention that it deserves given the amount of losses that it causes is very interesting. And this idea of trivialization is similar to this idea of defining deviancy down, uh, which was uh, uh, introduced by, by Moynihan, who was a former Harvard sociologist and later became a U.S. Uh, senator from the state of New York. He argues that we tolerate increasing amounts of common deviancy, that is, how much of it is normal. And here he's referring back to Durkheim's seminal idea of, of deviance being normal in society. He says, okay, that's fine. But how much of it is normal? When does it become abnormal? What, what level do we have to uh, come to before we say crime isn't normal? Uh, do we keep lowering the bar? This was a question that he talks about in this piece. Uh, are we getting too used to it as part of everyday life? That we no longer have reaction or outrage about it and uh, create those institutions to effectively deal with it. In that sense, he, he said, are we trivializing the lunatic crime rate? That we have this gigantic crime rate, he's talking about common crime, and we're not really doing anything about it. You know, we just keep lowering the bar, so we don't even arrest people anymore, or we'll tolerate more. Uh, of course, um, his, his analysis was aimed at common crime. Uh, he neglected white collar crime altogether. Another potential critique of this, of course, is that while we talk about trivializing this lunatic crime rate, which may be true, it was also the case that we raised the bar on various uh, uh, social issues and crime. Uh, uh, date rape, for example, uh, uh, and other uh, hate crimes. These things were not criminalized before, but became criminalized and became uh, objects of attention where we uh, aimed more uh, reaction to those forms of deviance. So the question arises if just using uh, that same uh, uh, terminology that Moynihan used, are we also neglecting the lunatic white collar and corporate crime rate? Uh, he wasn't talking about this. He was talking about street crime. But what I'm talking about here is, well, if that's the case for common crime, we have an invisible or a more invisible, less visible uh, type of social phenomenon here that we may also be ignoring and which may also be out of control, the lunatic white collar and corporate crime rate. Let's get into this. I'll talk about this for a few minutes and then we'll have time for some questions. Are major forms of white collar crime trivialized? That is, are they kept hidden by both ideology and limited government capacity? The one thing we do know about a lot of white collar crime is that to discover it and to, for it to be a, a quote unquote social reality, it must be proactively policed, especially at the highest levels of offending. Common crimes are typically reported. Sometimes they're not, but they're typically reported. That's how we become aware of them. People get something stolen, they report it to the police. Many times, we don't even know if we're being victimized by white collar crime. And so much of it is never reported, especially at the highest levels where it is most hidden. Another aspect of trivialization is that it can be operationally trivialized by researchers who use official data to study it. Now, of course, lots of studies look at official, use official data, 
that's fine. But they also need to uh, have uh, 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 boundaries around their generalizations using those types of data. Many serious white collar offenses are brought civilly and are not in official criminal databases. And official statistics necessarily underestimate white collar and corporate criminality, particularly those offenses that, be, that may be of the most consequence. So here, when you have studies that talk about quote unquote, white collar and corporate crime, and they are simply using official databases, they are very likely, almost certainly, are going, they are most certainly going to be underestimating the actual extent of those criminal behaviors. And uh, that's shown in so many cases where there are criminal charges that are brought or sometimes civil charges that could have been criminal charges. And much of these crimes, many of these crimes are settled civilly where the government essentially says, we'll take the, the, the penalties, we'll take the, the fines. We don't want to have protracted litigation in a criminal case that is not uh, that we're not certain to win. So they settle, and these things are never even brought criminally. That's a problem. So some final thoughts. I think I missed a slide here. Hold on a sec. Let me just go back. Oh, here it is. Thank you. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about Barry Getz's work. This is a very important piece. This is, I, to my mind, in, in thinking about white-collar crime, uh, I think that this piece uh, is one of the most important pieces that I've read uh, over the last few decades. Uh, uh, Barry Getz uh, teaches in Michigan. Uh, the piece was in Lawrence Society Review, uh, published in uh, 1997. Um, it's a bias in law enforcement, uh, and it's well worth reading. Um, he talks about, and this is the first piece that really talked about this, uh, he talks about white-collar crime as a quote-unquote non-issue. And this, of course, relates to the trivialization idea that I just discussed. He, he looked at, in this piece, he looked at uh, arson for profit fires in the city of Boston in the United States. And essentially what he finds is that authorities have blamed the fires on lower class building occupants for years, when in fact, it was eventually discovered that insurance fraud by landlords was the cause. These fires were not being set by lower class occupants of buildings. They were being set by the people who owned the buildings because they wanted to get insur their insurance payments. So it was a, a perfect example of white collar crime. Uh, and also a perfect example of how something remained why, how white collar crime remained a non-issue for years. And he looks at this in terms of ideological issues, bias uh, against the lower class, the capacity of the system to actually look at these issues and take them seriously. Uh, so it's, it's a very important piece. And I, I've used this a lot in my own work. I think this is a very uh, generic piece on uh, how white collar crime is typically treated. Uh, and as I said earlier, business narratives typically justify corruption as efficient, that is, it greases the wheels, it's necessary good for growth, et cetera. Uh, and that also masks the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, um, effects, the bad effects of white collar crime. Another narrative, which you could use for corruption, and this has been used by a colleague, uh, Bill Black, in a piece that he titled, Corruption Kills. Uh, and he talks about all of the problems where corruption has caused the death of many workers uh, in various countries. Uh, and I, one example, uh, when I was in China uh, years ago, I was there when this happened, a Sichuan earthquake that some of you may remember, but it was maybe 12, 13 years ago. Uh, there was a major earthquake in Sichuan, and school children had had uh, been killed by uh, the schools collapsing. And um, the, in short, it was found that there was uh, corruption in the inspection of these new schools where they were built with basically what was called tofu construction. They had all these uh, building inspectors were bribed. Uh, and newer schools that were supposed to be built to higher earthquake standards had fallen down and killed the children, whereas the older schools across the street had remained standing. 
and that was due to corruption. So in that sense, corruption kills. The deaths in Chinese coal mine disasters due to private inspectors also is another example. So to sum up, uh, some final thoughts on about causes and control. What, what's the bad news? Well, the bad news is, to me, there is no silver bullet. That is, there's no instant solution. There's no one way to deal with, with uh, white collar crime, just as there's not one way to deal with crime. Uh, the, we can't just eliminate it uh, in one stroke. There are many causes uh, that are similar to those found for common crime, uh, having to do with the theories that most criminologists use, opportunity, strain, learning, situational issues, etc. The good news to me is that when taken seriously, and this is the big leap that I think needs to occur, uh, there are ways to reduce various forms of white collar and corporate crime. Some of the issues here, and again, these are topical things we can discuss, that we need better and more responsive regulation. Uh, this has been brought up by numerous scholars, Braithwaite and others. Uh, compliance systems and incentives. This is a new movement that's been started, an international movement, that's been led by people like Benjamin uh, Van Roy in uh, uh, Amsterdam, who was also here at UCI for a number of years. Uh, he started a, a compliance network, uh, which includes many criminologists, as well as legal uh, experts uh, and psychologists and other behavioral experts, uh, recognizing and eliminating criminogenic environments that produce perverse incentives to commit fraud. We need to understand uh, that when you create situations where it uh, essentially involves incentives for people to break the law, we are going to have big crises. And I've written about this with Bob Tillman and uh, Bill Black in terms of how these environments are crime facilitated and how the, the lack of knowledge and understanding about fraud leads to these policy, bad policies and bad policy, to, uh, policy making that leads to environments where it's almost certain you're going to have massive fraud occurring and then later on, major crises due to that uh, environment. Um, also emphasizing ethics and education. We need to produce this in the schools and make sure that people understand that, uh, that fraud and white collar crime are serious issues and not wait until uh, people are being socialized in various kinds of organizations and environments where they're not gonna receive that kind of information. And also, and I put this last because I don't think this is the solution, although it's certainly important and it needs to be done, is that we need to improve law enforcement capacity. That is the resources and training that uh, go into white collar uh, uh, crime investigation, detection, uh, and prosecution. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your uh, attention and uh, I hope this was interesting. Thank you for okay. your... Uh, interesting presentation, an overview of uh, what color crime. Uh, we have now time for uh, debate. We, we have here one question in the, the chat. And uh, if you want to put other questions, I would ask to raise the hand uh, of the Zoom. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, the question that I am reading here in the chat is uh, what is uh, uh, environment racism? If you could give an example of uh, uh, environment racism. Oh, environmental racism, yes, yes. Uh, good question, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, environmental racism has to do with, uh, well, I'll give you one example so you can, you can see clearly. Um, with the fact that uh, in the U United States, uh, black communities, especially in the southern part of the country, have lived in areas that are uh, uh, exposed to major toxic dumping. That is, uh, there's a familiar phrase in the United States where people in suburban communities and people with more uh, power uh, and more political uh, uh, clout, a more political say, uh, say, uh, not in my backyard. And they have the power to control that. But poorer communities that don't have that, uh, which are mostly black uh, in the United States, 
don't have that power have to live with decision making done by others, which puts those environmental harms right at their doorstep. That's environmental racism. Uh, that's that's people suffering the consequences of, of waste disposal because they have no other means to prevent it. So that would be an example of environmental racism. Okay. Thank you. There is here another question by Norberto Silva. I don't know if you want to put the question or I can read the, uh, the, the chat. Uh, he's, uh, he's asking about uh, in cases of collusion between the perpetrators and uh, it's very difficult to detect white color crime. And the legal, the legal protection of whistleblowers could be a strong contribute in fraud detection. Um, what is the, your opinion uh, about this? If uh, case of collusion between perpetrators and uh, uh, the role of uh, whistleblowers and its protection. Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's very important. And it's, it, it's very much uh, been in the news in the United States lately, especially with uh, the impeachment of our past president, two impeachments, where whistleblowers did come forward. Um, their, their testimony was essentially impeached. Uh, so legally, it's very important to have those protections. And I think what we've just witnessed in the United States, at least, is the ability of very powerful people Uh, and in this case, the, one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful person in the world, the president of the United States, to basically uh, avoid that kind of uh, legal exposure due to those testimonies. Uh, I don't think that would be, I, so I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, is, yes, it's very important. Whistleblower laws are very important. They're necessary for uncovering these types of acts and can be very consequential in terms of producing legal uh, consequences. Um, but uh, I guess at the, at the same time, I'm saying that uh, power in this case was used to avoid that exposure. I don't think that would be the case with almost any other defendant, but it was the case with when you have the leader of a country uh, uh, who has immense power and has control of various aspects of government, can appoint officials who are going to be siding with them, et cetera, that they are able to avoid that kind of scrutiny. And of course, the politics go beyond that in terms of, uh, a lot of having enough people believing in the leader that other uh, legislators are afraid to act. And we've seen that in the United States as well. So that's on the political side. On the legal side, it's very important to have those whistleblower laws uh, intact. Otherwise, it's almost, uh, going back to the question, it's almost impossible to uh, uh, have evidence of the collusion. Yes, yes. We have, we have a, a strong experience in Portugal with crimes against uh, com um, competition and uh, whistleblowers uh, is the almost the only way to to punish uh, perpetrators But, yes uh, rita as a question yes hi thank you so much for your presentation it was really fantastic um and again i'm i'm really uh, deeply honored uh, to have you to host you in this uh, in this cjs conference and i would like to uh, to ask a question so You mentioned, obviously, uh, those of us who research on white collar crime already know that you can't trust official data to really understand the numbers of uh, white collar crimes. Uh, what kind of, and we, we all know that it's really hard to conduct empirical research on white collar crime. It's very challenging. You need to be very creative to find ways to access data. Um, What advice would you give like to novice younger researchers who are doing their masters or PhD uh, dissertations on white color crime? What, what kind of advice would you give uh, about the research tools to use to produce more data and better data about white color crime? Thank you. Hmm. That's a great question. It's very, very important. Thank you, Rita. Uh, 
I guess an integrated approach. Uh, my, my my feeling is that there are there are parts of of uh, the phenomenon that can be approached through quantitative uh, uh, data. And when you want to talk about sanctioning studies, for example, you could clearly use official data for looking at sanctions of uh, various acts. But you have to be able to uh, contain those generalizations and see which cases are not being entered into those databases so that you can come up with, with, with reasonable and scientific conclusions, uh, not going beyond the data. My, uh, my other take on it would be uh, uh, from my, my, my mentor, Gilbert Geis, who wrote one of, the most, uh, uh, one of the most important pieces in criminology on the general electric uh, price fixing cases in the United States in 1961. And that, that uh, one piece was one of the most cited pieces in criminology for many, many years and re, uh, reawakened our interest in uh, white collar crime as, as scientists. Uh, and what he did was, it was a case study and uh, he used data from uh, the news media uh, and court documents uh, to basically weave together the story and the most important aspects of that case and combine that with our criminological understandings of, of, of white collar crime and crime in general to come up with a story that exposed what actually occurred and how it occurred. So case study, and he's also written a, a very good piece on the case study in criminology, case studies for people who are beginning in this area would be an excellent, to my mind, would be an excellent way to proceed. To get, get a case, whether it's ongoing or finished, uh, completed, and to look very deeply into that case, you know, in terms of motivations, in terms of law, in terms of all the issues around that case that could be brought to bear uh, on uh, criminological concerns. So and I've done that in some cases, uh, but the, the, uh, my work on medical fraud, uh, savings and loan, I've combined it with personal interviews. Uh, we've, we've talked to criminal doctors. We've talked to law enforcement agents to get a holistic picture of what is going on in that area. So um, I did that with financial fraud, did it with medical fraud. It's not easy. You're right. It's, it's very, it's the, you, you can't just sit at a computer and pull up a bunch of survey data and say, okay, let's, let's publish six papers. It doesn't work like that. Uh, it's, it's much more on the ground, in person, uh, a lot of detective type of work, but you can do it. It's just, it's, uh, we need governments and, and institutes to realize that work's important and it needs that kind of funding and uh, uh, resources attached to it. And this is part of the trivialization aspect. Why is it so trivialized? Well, how much research funding actually goes into this area? The answer is not very much. <laughs> uh, and so we need to change that. We need to really focus more on the kinds of these issues that harm so many people uh, in so many countries. And uh, case studies, qualitative work, historical work, uh, integrative work is very important. I hope that's responsive, but I think that's thank you kind so of much. I, that's great. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you. Uh, Leonardo Conde has a question. Yes, can I speak? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, so firstly, I would like to thank the, the teacher for the teachings that were transmitted. And in this regard, I would like to ask him, ask you if you consider that the scientific literature that has neglected the study of individual criminal criminogenic factors due to a view that is too focused on the study of, overly focused on the study of situational characteristics. And if you consider that a greater study of these factors, of the individual factors, may also enhance the prevention of this criminality. And thank you again. Thank you, Leonardo. Uh, good, great question. I, I, as I hear it, uh, uh, you, I, I guess you're talking about the individual characteristics versus the more situational or structural exactly. uh, characteristics. Yeah, and there's, there's, you know, the, the jury the jury isn't really in on that yet. There have been some studies looking at uh, personality factors, for example, uh, 
and there's been also the life course theories regarding white collar criminals. Uh, the jury's not in on it. The, the ends in those samples are so small that it's very difficult to say, well, it's this type of person that will commit white collar crime versus that kind of person. There's always some kind of uh, aspect of the person being involved in a in a in a an organizational setting or a real environment. Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, uh, you can have a, a person. You know, one of the findings from some of these studies is that white collar criminals tend to be excessive risk takers. Well, that's true. Uh, it, some of them are, but there are many excess. There are many excessive risk takers that don't go over the line. And there are many white collar criminals who aren't that excessive in terms of their risk taking. So you can you can kind of put these um, personality profiles on certain folks, uh, and it goes so far. You know that, that that's really the point. Yeah, some of those things aren't good. You know, people don't have the proper ethics. They they may be excessive risk takers, etc. But there's been no studies that I've seen that can say with any certainty that it's all about personality factors. Uh, in and I'll give you another example, um, a very famous example here with the Pentagon Papers, where a, a person who was seen in, in uh, 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 name is on the top of my head, I can't think of his name off, offhand, but he was working for the government. He blew the whistle on the uh, what were called the Pentagon Papers, which were the, se the secret government documents talking about why the United States was involved in the Vietnam War. And in uh, on, on one term, people looked at him as like, he was totally ethical because he uh, revealed this and let people know what was really going on. And on the other side, he was seen as, uh, he was demonized because he broke with his uh, 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 agreement not to talk about this. He was under all kinds of, uh, 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 secrecy laws you know, working at the government. So, you know, what is it? You know, is he a hero? Is he a villain? What, what, what is it about his personality? Uh, did he do the right thing? Did he do the wrong thing? Uh, so it's a very difficult, you know, thing. I, I'd say from my perspective, I think individual characteristics certainly may play a role, but they don't play a role uh, uh, in the uh, absence of a particular situation. Okay, thank you, teacher. Again, that's the, that's the best I can do with it. I'm not a I'm not a psychologist. I'm sure they would have more to say about that, uh, and there's more research. But again, the ends are so small that it would be uh, you, you couldn't generalize at this point. Uh, thank you. I, I have. But one thank you. Thank you for the question. It's a very important what? issue. Very important issue. Profiling. Uh, I have one question. Also, it's about uh, the difficulties of punishing white collar offenders and the efficiency of the system of justice. At this moment, uh, we are experiencing in Portugal some frustration with the inability of the system of justice to deal with the complexity of white collar crime. Um, special long duration of the criminal investigations that are not finished before crimes are time buried and difficulty in obtaining uh, evidence to prove uh, corruption. And my question is how to deal with difficult in punishing white collar uh, crime offenders? Uh, this, is a, this is an age old problem. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Vita had sent me the, a piece about, I, I just saw it about the, the, the problems in Portugal with the former prime minister and the delays and the justice, et cetera. And I jotted down a few notes because as I started reading it, I said, wow, how similar all, we all are <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of the same problems existing across the world. This is, this is incredible. And we're about to be in the same situation as Portugal uh, here in the United States if uh, the and I think it will uh, if these indictments come down against the former president and how long it's going to take and how they're going to be watered down and how he may not be brought up on charges that are fully in line with what he did but just certain little things and I'll talk about that in a second so yeah there's lots of similarities here but let me just say I agree uh, that you know there's an old saying in the United States that uh, just maybe it's international. I don't know, but it, 
we, we say justice delayed is justice denied. Okay. And so the longer it takes, the better the chances of not having justice. And that's actually something in the toolkit of many powerful white collar criminals. Um, and I'll talk about our former president as one example who uses the legal system, who has the resources to use the legal system in ways that abuse the law and that abuse justice. And this is something that is uh, pretty common with powerful white collar defendants, that the, they, you, they, they will get the best legal defense, they will have the best uh, uh, lawyers, they will drag it out as far as they can, they will produce as much doubt as they can, they will, uh, essentially end up settling or uh, uh, settling for many or getting off altogether or settling for so few charges that had to do with what, what happened. Now, let me, I'll give you an example. Uh, and, and this goes back to capacity issues, which I've talked about in, yeah. in much of my other work, system capacity issues, which I think are important. And I wasn't talking about them in terms of white collar crime, but they refer, they're even more uh, relevant to the area of white collar crime because of the power and the resources that these defendants can bring to their cases and how small they make the government look in terms of their ability to deal with these things. Um, the, uh, the case I wanted to talk about was the, the savings and loan case. When I was doing my savings and loan work, which were the, the fraudulent banks in the United States that all went bankrupt and created a major crisis, yeah. um, I was talking to a lot of enforcement agents, the Secret Service and the, the FBI and folks who were trying to investigate these cases and seeing what they were dealing with. And I said, how can you go through, how could you look at these complex frauds from these very wealthy people, very powerful defendants, uh, and get through all of these cases that you have to do? You don't have the, the capacity. They had to somehow rearrange their whole mindset in terms of how they would approach these cases. And I think it's relevant to the question. Yeah. Um, they turned it, you know, there were so many things going on in these complex cases and so many charges that they could bring, right? But they'd have to prove every single one of them and every single link with each in order to provide a conviction. That's, uh, they said, all the, all the defendant would have to do was break one link you could have 20 things you could prove. And if there was that one thing that they couldn't prove, the whole case fell apart. So they started with this idea, oh, we have to go after these crooks and get everything. And they said, we'll never get through. We have thousands of these cases. There were too many cases. There were never so many white collar crime cases in the history of the United States at one time. And so the government had to adjust itself. What did they do? They formed task forces. They said, we have so many cases, we need this regulation, this regulator who knows about this. We need the FBI who knows about that. We need the Secret Service who knows about currents. They needed all these different people to collaborate on the investigation and prosecution. It wasn't just a single prosecutor or a single person. They created task forces. That was first. The second thing they did, which I thought was very important and the only way they could do it, was they, they took what they called a rifle shot approach rather than a shotgun approach. The shotgun approach would be looking at the whole thing, saying, oh, there's this, there's this, there's yes. this. We have to prove it all, right? A rifle shot approach took aim at one little thing, mail fraud. They did this, they did that, and they could prove it so easily. Right? They couldn't show the entire fraud. And this also relates to the trivialization idea because in official statistics, you'd never see the whole thing because it was never proven, right? All they yeah. did was take one, two, three, four and said, aha, we can prove this. We'll get a guilty plea immediately and the perpetrator will pay back X amount of dollars and will serve X amount of time in prison. So... They got the person for you know returning most of the money. They got a uh, five-year sentence instead of maybe a 10 or a 20-year sentence. They were happy. And then they could move on to the next case. That's what they did. So the rifle shot approach was very effective in terms of lessening this incapacity issue. That was, they gave them the capacity to move through these cases 
get convictions, but they were never going to get the big the old, picture yeah. on the biggest perpetrators. Charles Keating, major example, a major fraudster. He had the biggest financial failure in the United States of a, of a, a financial institution in history at that time, something like $4 billion losses. And it was all due to fraud. One of my former graduate students was a regulator, worked on the case, knew everything about Keating, and it was all there. Uh, uh, Keating was only convicted on one small thing that he did that was a certain thing that he did, and he was put in prison for it. But it was never proven. that the, the prosecutors never bothered to say, oh, let's go after him on everything. They'd be in court for years, and there would be uncertainty in terms of the conviction. So relating to capacity, I think that's really important. Your question is, is really on the mark. And I think that the, the way that we do white collar crime cases in the United States shows that that rifle shot approach, that individual picking out various aspects that you can prove, it, that's how it works most of the time. You never get the entire scandal that's proven uh, because of the capacity issue. And uh, so that's what we deal with. And I think that's probably the same throughout the world. So I, I noticed in the, in the prime minister, your, your prime minister's case, that you know they dropped charges on various things. They were only going after these things. It took years to get to that point. This is this is a typical issue, especially with powerful defendants. So the only hope is that if this person did all these things, and there was you know more or less enough evidence of that that most people would say, of course he did, that there would be these smaller things that they were able to prove very easily that he will be charged with and convicted with. But that uh, the same thing is going to happen with Trump. Uh, I, I, I will predict it right now. You're the first to know, the first to hear this. I'll predict it right now that when he's indicted in New York, which I believe he will be, he might be indicted in Georgia. Uh, when he's indicted, it's never going to come down to look at all of the things that he, all the frauds and the tax things and the bank frauds. No, it'll be a couple of things that they'll be able to get him on. That's a good suggestion for that. <laughs> but that's that's how it works. That's yes. how it works. Yeah. I have here two more questions. I, I don't know if you will. Uh, okay. Uh, One is from uh, Katia Tume. I don't know if you... Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hi. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, as a master's student who's researching on the white collar crime area, uh, it was really interesting and really nice to see there are some passionate people like you uh, in this area. So. Uh, my question, I hope I don't sound dumb, <laughs> uh, but I would like to ask, it relates a little to what we were talking about, uh, the complexity of the prosecution of this, this, but more in the detection phase, uh, for example, I'm investigating and researching in the money laundering area, And I've been conducting interviews with compliance officers. And one of the main issues that they discuss with me is uh, being able to detect this type of crime, even though they do have specific um, softwares for it. Since it's such a complex, complex thing, I, I don't know if you have some experience in the area or if you have some comments as to what can be done to improve this and improve the efficiency in this, in this area? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> my, my, first, my first response is no, I'm not an expert on money laundering, but <laughs> Michael, Michael, Michael Levy in, in, at Cardiff yes. in England yes. is the, I think the world's expert, you're, you're familiar with yes. him, obviously. Yes. And so he's the person that, that, that would answer that question 10 times, 100 <laughs> times better than I could. Uh, but, um, You know, I'll just say, I did have some experience looking at some of the money laundering issues uh, related with uh, uh, terrorism uh, back uh, a while ago. And, uh, you know, it's a very, it's a very difficult area. You know, the, the, the countries will try to produce the regulations that are going to uh, allow for less uh, money laundering to occur. And there's always... Uh, some regulatory hole or some advantage 
that someone will do to get around that. And it's a constant battle. It's so if anything, the the one thing I would say about it, and Michael uh, Levy would know more specifics in terms of various uh, regulatory practices, um, that it's a constant uh, game. It's a if you let your guard down for one second, uh, it's no good. You know they're they're going to take advantage one way or the other. So in the U.S., you know I'm sure everywhere they we have laws about how much you can transfer and how much you do this and how much you do that, and it's always a way. So, you know, software systems, I really think algorithms to look at various type of transfer uh, patterns are the way to go. I mean, I've done this with medical fraud also. That's a great investigative tool. It's, diff it's still difficult. You don't get absolute certainty, but at least you pinpoint, you can target where you should be looking more closely. And that's about the best, best you can do. Um, you know, the criminals have the resources. They have the, the, the ability to circumvent a lot of these uh, regulatory systems. And they do. This is how it works. Uh, in, during the, the uh, terrorist attacks, I was talking with, uh, with the, I think with the Secret Service about tracing assets of various groups and terrorists. They weren't even using the financial system. They were using, uh, what was it called? Havala, uh, a, a bartering system by which they could totally circumvent all the money laundering laws and the, and the financial institutions in terms of transferring uh, 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 capital. So it's, uh, you know, going back to what you said about the, the computer systems, yes, com constant development, constant pinpointing, constant use, and never, uh, and, and when something else is seen, developing something else that catches that, because it's, it's like computer crime. Uh, it's always a game of catch up and you cannot let your guard down. You can't stop at one point saying, we've solved the problem. Uh, as soon as you do that, the, the clever criminal, and there's always going to be someone there, uh, is going to say, oh, you think you've solved it? I'll show you that I can still get around it. Uh, and, you know, th that, that's got kind of the first law of computer crime, uh, which is if it can be done, someone will do it. And that's why you constantly have to keep uh, uh, moving forward in terms of better surveillance systems. So, yeah, no silver bullet there either. <laughs> Thank you. A good question. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, uh, there are more two questions. I don't know if you don't mind. <laughs> That's fine. I'm, I, I'm not going anywhere, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's nice being here talking with people. This is great. Uh, so, so, Leonard Conde, I give you the word. Yes, thank you, teacher. Uh, so, my my the another question that I have for you, teacher, is if you consider that we are witnessing in the modern world new forms of white collar crime, namely committed by middle class individuals, that due to the internal transformations in the functioning of companies, for example, that leads to the passage of administrative responsibilities from CEOs to lower ranking employees, if I'm, if I'm being understa understandful, uh, and whether this is a real, and whether if this reality will not require the formulation of new concepts or sub-concepts of white collar crime. Hmm. Well, wow, that's a big question. Uh, that's a, that's a great question. Is it, you know, I'd have to think about that to give you a really, uh, I'd have to think about that for a while to really give you a, a, a reasonable response. Um, if I understand, I think I understand the question in terms of new forms. Yes. And the new forms uh, have to do with, uh, can be related directly to things like computer frauds, computer crimes, in terms of organizational uh, issues. Uh, uh, I would relate those new forms to um, uh, financial transactions and uh, re responding to regulatory uh, laws that attempt to uh, curtail certain types of frauds. In terms of new forms uh, in the organizational setting, and I have to th think about it just momentarily here, uh, that th th there aren't many new forms. There are always some form that, that, that may be a, a different modus operandi, but it's based on a, on a Ponzi or uh, you know, a securities, you know, a typical securities fraud or insider trading or something like that. 
uh, and it's a way to get around, but the new forms may have to do with ways that they're carried out, the modus operandi, in terms of getting around regulations. regulations. In terms of new forms of, of fraud, or new term, terms, forms of crime, computer crime, I think, is a good example, because anything technologically associated is going to have various new forms. Now, again, they're frauds. They may be kind of uh, like Ponzi's, but uh, you know, we before the advent of computers and before the advent of the, or the proliferation of the internet, we didn't have phishing uh, as a <laughs> as a major form of uh, of crime, of computer crime. But now we do, and it's very very costly, and it's evolving as time goes on. You know, there's all kinds of different types of attacks and things like that. So with technology, I think you you probably have a greater degree of evolving types of frauds. But certainly within organizations, uh, you will have various ways to get around whatever regulatory um, uh, efforts there are to curtail older forms of fraud, which again goes back to as a Katya's uh, uh, question in terms of a, of a, a constant reevaluation and a constant uh, monitoring never being satisfied that the surveillance uh, and the regulations are done. You need to, they need to evolve. Okay, thank you, oh. teacher, again. Thank you. And now, Eva, hello, Eva. You can put your yeah. question. <laughs> uh, hello, um, yeah, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Eva Inzat. I'm from the Otvish Branch University, Budapest, Hungary, and uh, uh, really nice to see you and uh, nice to you. see you again Eva how are you nice to see you nice uh, to see you here thank you very much for the University of Porto to organize this wonderful event and of course uh, Professor Ponta to share your interesting thoughts um, my question you, you touch upon some of the point of my question uh, but it's focusing on that what do you think what is the most efficient way to um, control white color crime or what is uh, uh, the good approach uh, to, to control white color crime? I mean that, um, is it much more a criminal law control or an administrative uh, law perspective? So where is the, the role or what is the role of the criminal justice system or and what could be the role of the regulatory system uh, in, in, in this fight against the white color crime or corporate crime? Sure, sure. that's a great question and uh, thank you very much for it. Uh, I think it's, you know, in short, it's an integrated approach. I don't get, you know, I don't give the criminal justice system that much of a role in uh, controlling this. I agree with John Braithwaite and others. Uh, compliance and regula regulation are going to be much more effective in the long run. Uh, and again, going back to the capacity issues that we talked about earlier, it would be virtually impossible, just as it would be impossible to increase the capacity of law enforcement to take away all crime, because it would just be so over, it would be police state, essentially, uh, that uh, it would not be worth the citizens' resources to be used in that manner. So um, I think compliance, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, Benjamin Van Roy at uh, University of Amsterdam and UCI have started a compliance network uh, with various social scientists, well, legal experts, uh, that I think is very positive in terms of its approach to uh, 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 stopping white collar crime or preventing or controlling white collar crimes and other uh, kinds of uh, uh, legal violations that with compliance systems, and I'm not an expert on compliance systems, but I understand the concept and I think it's very important, very robust in terms of how it will be used in a positive fashion, not spending money on back end uh, reactions like the criminal justice system to prevent these things from occurring in the first place. In other words, inducing people to do the right thing, not threatening them that if they don't do the right thing, they're gonna get penalties because that's just that. It becomes a cost of doing business for a lot of uh, big companies and, and rich individuals that they don't care because they go, okay, fine, I'll pay the, I'll pay the fine. I still walked away with a billion dollars. I, you know, I paid a million, it's silly. You know, the, 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 the typical deterrent and now uh, uh, equation that does not work with white collar criminals. 
Uh, so I think an integrated approach where, you, you know, which is similar to the enforcement pyramid that uh, Grabowski and, and Braithwaite worked on earlier, I think that makes sense. That you start very broad, you reduce compliance, you, you get, you, you, you let people know that you're looking and that they, they should be doing the right things, but don't just use the criminal justice system as the quote unquote first uh, uh, response. That the first response is uh, uh, negotiation and making sure that things are in, in place. And this is what the compliance systems, I, I think that they're developing from various perspectives. And this is just starting. We have psychologists, sociologists, uh, criminologists, uh, others who are working on these compliances. What is it about human behavior? What is it about organizational behavior that we can put into uh, a decent policy to create systems that monitor themselves? You know, that basically re re not relying on criminal justice to do this. So compliance systems, I think, is the way to go. Uh, and that, that's going to be, I think that's the, the, the wave of the future. Uh, in terms of better regulation, of course, that's part of it. The criminal justice system is part of it, but I think it should be a rather small part. If these compliance systems are successful, we will be able to see less of a role for criminal justice and less money being spent on those, uh, those institutions. So I think, is that responsive? Is that responsive to your question? I think it's compliance is, is bottom line here. Uh, th thank you very much. Can I have just one short follow-up question? Sure, sure. Um, I, I totally uh, agree with you. And in the last uh, few years, I was much more focusing on that direction. So see the, the, the role of the regulatory agencies and compliance to, to control white collar crime and corporate crime, especially in Hungary, in different economic uh, crimes like cartels, uh, for example. Uh, but I was wondering that uh, I think in high profile cases, so I don't know, cases where ministers or prime ministers or high level of um, uh, either uh, private or public sector uh, professionals involved, uh, it could be I mean, criminal justice system or criminal law could be really valid to um, um, to somehow deter uh, in in a in a, in a in a general prevention level, so I think there is there is an important part, or it could be an important part, um, if could be enough capacity of the criminal justice system and and so on, which you already mentioned and we were talking about. But I think it's uh, it's really hard and it's a really biased situation in that sense. That's yeah, I, I would I would agree. I agree. Yeah, I think what we're talking about state crime are very high level crimes. Uh, clearly, there has to be accountability, and clearly, uh, those though in those cases, uh, you have uh, folks who have uh, uh, denied the rule of law that they've abused the law to, in order to stay above it, which is a flagrant violation of the rule of law. And so, in those cases, where it's possible. And it may not be possible in all jurisdictions or in all countries to bring to bring that accountability. And we're dealing with that in the U.S. right now with the former president, uh, that, uh, that it, the criminal justice system, again, can only go so far. Uh, but it clearly needs to be brought to bear uh, where there's that kind of evidence. But in terms of state crime or in the case of a very high level of justice, of, uh, a high level government official, committing crime either personally or on behalf of the state or some combination, it becomes very complicated. And so uh, I agree that in those kinds of cases, in the high profile cases and the cases where there's a clear abuse of law that the criminal justice system needs to be involved. Uh, that's, you know, we're not talking about uh, run of the mill, you know, corporate violations, or we're talking about the highest crimes that there could be, which is crimes of the state. And so, uh, or, or people who are in charge of the state, uh, the, the committing personal crimes crime of personal benefit. So, uh, yeah, I would, I would definitely agree. But, you know, and so I guess the, the, the point being that depending on the case, that's where you go to uh, for prevention control uh, issues. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I don't know if there is an, any question. I think uh, we are finished of questions. I would like to thank you very much. It was really a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you soon here in Porto as soon as possible. It will, uh, it will be great. <laughs> thank you very uh, much, Jose. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure being here with you. Thank you.